Good morning. Today I would like to focus attention on the Shang Dynasty. The Shang Dynasty dates to about 1500 BC. The Chinese have a very elaborate system of dating and uh, they track back they track the Shang Dynasty back to 1766. However, uh, archaeologists uh, indicate that they can't they can't prove that. Uh, so we will go with uh, 1500 BC. It shouldn't be surprising that the Shang Dynasty will emerge in on the North China Plain. This is the area that uh, is very, very fertile. It, it's great. It's great farmland. And, it, and to this very day, this is the area where you're going to have the largest uh, number of, of Chinese concentrated. Now, one of the issues that sets the Shang Dynasty apart from its predecessor is the fact that they have left us an elaborate documentary record. And uh, th those records take the form of oracle bones. Oracle bones come at you in, in two varieties. Uh, they will uh, uh, appear as uh, the, the scapula of, a, um, of, of oxen or uh, plastrons, which, which is simply the, the underside, the uh, under portion of the turtle shell. And uh, these are going to be very, very large bones. I mean, uh, uh, an ox, ox, ox shoulder bone can be quite large, as can be the underside of a turtle, uh, underside of the turtle shell, because these turtles will be captured in the, uh, in the North China Sea more than likely. And, and what would then happen is they would take these bones and they would dry them out. And once these uh, bones were dried out, they would take a, a metal, a, a bronze object, and, um, and the object would then be heated. And then you would press it against the bone. And then you would, you would uh, uh, based on how the bone cracked, uh, royal diviners would, would read it. Um, what they would do is they would use these to ask an ancestor specific questions and and these would be very very detailed very specific questions normally it would take the form of a pretty elaborate uh, ceremony most of the time the ceremonies took place early in the morning and and so this this royal cult that that formed around uh, the, the Shang dynasty, they would uh, get up in the morning, uh, they would participate in a very elaborate ceremony, go to a ceremonial hall, and uh, the royal diviners would go through this process and um, press the bronze object against the, uh, uh, against the oracle bone, the bone would crack, and, um, and, and based on how that bone cracked, that would reveal the answers to to the questions that had been asked. In other words, in other words, you might call on a specific ancestor and uh, say uh, an, an earlier king, and and ask him for an answer to say should should we launch an invasion of the subord non subordinates on on our periphery, uh, or you might you might call on a specific ancestor to ask. Should the queen or will the queen's next birth be an, an easy one? Or should we, should we harvest now? So they would be very, very specific questions that you would ask the, the ancestors. And, and based on how the bone cracked, uh, that would be the interpretation. And, and, the, and it would be the job of the uh, official diviners to read that crack. And, uh, and, and so that would be the answer to, to the question. Now, the, the, the diviners, what's, what's really interesting is uh, they, they have provided something of an archive here. Um, because what happened was uh, when a question was asked of an ancestor, it would be written down. 
and 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 when and when the ancestor answered you know based on the crack in the oracle well then the diviners would write that down too so they they they, they record the question they record the answer that was given to them and then they would record the results or the outcome and uh, all of this will, will be provided. It, it looks like they would go through this process, perhaps ask a question about the upcoming harvest. And they might ask that question eight or ten times. And then seven times the answer is, is, is very positive. Three times the answer is, is, is negative. And they tended to then take which, you know, the average. Um, and, and, and so what they have provided really is an archive. And I understand that it's, you know, just, it's, it's just a treasure trove of, of information. Uh, these, oracle, these, these oracle bones actually were discovered in the area uh, of, of, of China in uh, about the 19th century. And, uh, and they were peasants. All these peasants were digging up these oracle bones that had actually broken into fragments. And they were taking them into the cities. And they were, they were selling them. And, and large numbers of these fragments were appearing in, um, in old Chinese drugstores or old Chinese pharmacies, if you will. And uh, there was an archaeologist who was traveling through China in about 1890, and uh, he was in this he was in this drugstore, and he saw some of these things, and he went, "Wow, you know, this is this is really important stuff." Now, when the peasants were extracting it from the earth, they understood that it was very important, but they they couldn't read it, uh, and, and so they 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 were selling it, selling these oracle bones inside the cities. Now, just having uh, a, a official diviners and, and royal diviners that were actually able to in, interpret uh, the oracle bones and, and provide guidance to the king really legitimized his, his monarchy. I mean, it, it wasn't that he was the handsomest or he had the, had the largest number of, uh, of military men following him. Uh, it, it was the fact that the royal diviners were able to interpret uh, for him, and, uh, and, and and that that tended to legitimize it tended to legitimize his power because it was only he that could call on the royal diviners, and it was only these royal diviners that could provide direction to the monarchy. Uh, the king, the monarchy, is going to really be the center of the Shang dynasty. I mean, it's going to be the very center of the political system. And uh, life expectancy was really not all that long. Uh, in, in ancient China, uh, there's a, there's a ver probably uh, people lived, I mean, this would be good if you made it this far, uh, people would live to say somewhere around the age of, of 30. And um, so what, what that means is, uh, well, the problem then becomes, if you serve as king for a while, chances are you are only going to live to be 30, 31 years old, and then you die. And, and so the question becomes, what happens to the monarchy? Uh, if, you've, if you've studied, say, British history, uh, you know that the monarchy tends to, f to basically be passed on from father to son. Well, in, in China, it doesn't follow or adhere to this sort of, of process. Because in many cases, if the king dies at 30, his sons are going to be too young. And uh, so what will happen during the Shang Dynasty is if, if, if in one generation the king dies, say, at 32, the institution of the monarchy then passes to his brother, his, his, his brother who is uh, closest to him in age. So it's his next younger brother. And when that brother dies, then the institution or the, the kingship or monarchy then passes to the next younger brother. 
And, and so within the, the span of, say, a generation, all of these different brothers die off. Well, then what happens is, is it goes back. It goes back to the eldest son of that, of that first king. Okay? And then it goes through that sort of process. Uh, so it goes to the eldest son of the next generation, which you know, makes it pretty unique. Uh, but China, in many regards, is going to be unique. But keep in mind, uh, the Shang Dynasty is going to go on for, for some time. Uh, we're we're going to ad adhere to this process, and, and the monarchy is going to pass through uh, 29 different reigns, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, you know, a little over five, five centuries. Uh, in terms of in, in regard to the Shang dynasty so it, it does go on for some time while uh, the Shang dynasty goes on for for some time uh, they they tended to establish royal capitals but, but they didn't stick with them for very long they, they tended to, to pass from one capital to another create one capital and then and then move on uh, during the entire time of the dynasty uh, they, they're going to make over over nine changes and um, it, it will only be during the final 200 years of the Shang dynasty that they tended to actually post hole in and create a royal palace and maintain a royal palace in one very small um, a city Now, the Shang dynasty, uh, or the Shang people, really, they were a, 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 a feder they were really a federation of peoples, meaning there were a lot of people that lived here that were, uh, they were related, they, they, they were clansmen, they were brothers, sisters, they were cousins, uncles, I mean, they're related by blood. But on the other hand, there were those that were part of the Shang people, or the Shang Empire, if you will, that they, that they were not related. They were not related by blood. What actually connected them uh, were a couple of things. One, they participated in these royal cults. They participated in these royal cults that, that I have described, the reading of the oracle bones. They participated in that royal cult. And what also connected them was the fact that uh, it was the written word. Uh, that, they, uh, that, that the Shang kings communicated with those on the periphery in, uh, in written form. And it's a very, very elaborate system. Orders were dispersed throughout the empire from the inside to the periphery. This is going to be a very sophisticated and a very, very elaborate system. The Shang Dynasty is, is, is a truly, truly fascinating dynasty. And uh, to, to really just stress the importance of this dynasty and to stress the stress how elaborate and sophisticated it could be, we need only look at the, um, the commitment to divination. And uh, with that with the sorts of um, uh, stresses and requirements it imposed upon the Shang Empire. Now, in order to get something of a, of a handle on how elaborate and sophisticated the Shang Dynasty was, we just simply have to look at metallurgy. Uh, metallurgy, it, it will, they will produce, during the Shang Dynasty, they will produce all of these sorts of ornaments and objects that will be used during or for uh, divination purposes. And these objects will be made out of bronze. And so these, these objects have got to be cast. So you're, it's going to require that you have people that will make the molds. Uh, they will, somebody will have to pour uh, the, the, the metal. Uh, somebody or some people are going to have to, to decorate. Uh, there, there's, there's just a whole range of jobs that will be associated with this metallurgical process. And, uh, and, and, and it's going to require uh, people to work. And we, we have found uh, uh, workshops where people huddled around this entire operation. And, and it's going to require lots and lots of people to participate in the whole process. 
Uh, how do you pull this off? How do you how do you manage to get people to do this sort of thing? Well, on the one hand, it's going to take um, you know, central organization. Uh, it's going to take the ability to mobilize uh, mass numbers of people to participate in the process, and um, and, and and so. It, it will in the Shang Dynasty. This will all come in the form of a, of a pretty pretty large bureaucracy that will be in place to uh, handle and to manage this metallurgical process because it will be the state that runs it. Now, if you have this many people working for you, and, and I cannot provide numbers, I can only say that based on the workshops that have been located. Uh, it would have been several. Uh, they will have to be fed. And, and so how do you feed them? Or how do you raise the money to feed them? And the answer is, of course, this very large bureaucracy that you have in place that's responsible for managing the metallurgical process will also be responsible for collecting the taxes that will be used to, to pay these people and, and to, to feed these people. And it will be those same uh, tax, the, that say, those same bureaucrats raising those taxes that will be used to uh, 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 fund or pay your military. Now, the military is going to be very, very important. We know from the oracle bones, the types of questions that were asked, that uh, the, the kings were always concerned about those peoples that lived on the periphery, uh, those, those non-subordinate peoples. And, and, and they're very, very concerned. Should questions are asked, should we conduct raids or not? Are they coming? Uh, should we harvest now? Or are we under threat or will we be under threat uh, by outsiders if we uh, harvest at this specific point? So we do know that north, south, uh, and, and, and west, the peoples around them, uh, that the Shang Dynasty was in fact concerned. Tensions began to develop. And um, some of the uh, subordinate peoples began to really resent the fact that they were being taxed and that monies and agricultural surplus was, was being extracted by the Shang kings. Uh, that will contribute to some of the resentment, uh, but it, it's also going to be uh, fed by the fact that you have these non-subordinates who are living outside on the periphery who, who are conducting raids inside the Shang Empire. And, and people feel vulnerable. They feel like they're not being protected. So why pay these tribute? Why pay this tribute if you're not going to protect us with this military might uh, that the king possesses? And, and so... You see tensions and fissures actually developing inside the Shang dynasty. And the dynasty will ultimately be toppled by outsiders. And we will look at that next time we meet. Enjoy life and good day.